Hello, I am Julia Genoviva, and we are here on our third episode of It's Gonna Get Artsy with myself, Julia Genoviva, and my co-host, Gus Ferrari. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I can't believe this is our third episode. And yeah. Um, yeah, and Gus and I are super, super excited because today we will be speaking to the St. Jean's players. They are working on their production, The Laramie Project. So thank you all for coming and talking to us today. We're so excited to have you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So before we start, um, I would just like everyone to please, you know, say your name, introduce yourselves, and what is your role in this um, riveting and amazing production? Who would you Hello? like to start? Uh, Sharon can start first, please. Okay, my name is Sharon Lowe. I'm the president of the St. Jean's Players. And my role in the Laramie Project is I'm doing practically everything there is to be done behind the scenes. And we're calling that producer. Uh, so, um, and I'm, I've, of all the people from the St. Jean's Players that are on this interview, I have been around the longest. So I'd be able to give you, fill you in on some of the background that not everybody knows. Incredible. Uh, Eugene, please. <laughs> Yes, I'm Eugene Lefkowitz. I'm, I'm directing this production. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you. I'll talk a little bit more about my background with St. Jean's Players when we get to that. Great. Um, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Lucy, please. Hi, I'm Lucy Apicello. I'm the assistant director for the Laramie Project, and I'm also a board member of the St. Jean's Players and a long time uh, behind the scenes and on the scenes, on stage, stage person. Great, great, fabulous. And now I'll hand it over to the cast. Uh, Marjorie and Scott, if you can please introduce yourselves. Hi, Marjorie. And uh, this is my first time working with St. Jean's. In fact, I hate to say it, but I never heard of them before until, I don't know, somehow it landed. I know, the auditions for the Laramie Project landed in my email. And, you know, I took note of when the auditions were and um, I went. And, Met uh, me. I'm very excited. It's a beautiful theater and everybody's so committed, all the cast, you know, and it's nice working with the big cast, right? Mm -hmm. 15 people. Wow, amazing. Um, and Scott, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, uh, well, my name's Scott Watson Moronis. And uh, I'm just going to stop myself because that's probably the first time I've actually said that out loud, that my name was Scott Watson Moronis <laughs> because I got married last year in june oh, and right. i haven't actually got to say my full name out loud but it's 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 <laughs> nice to like you. We, you know <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you um uh yeah so i am uh i've been a uh, uh i am one of the characters in the show of uh of the laramie project i actually play multiple same thing with marjorie we both play multiple characters throughout the show uh, but I've been with uh, St. Jean's Players. I just look back at old photos. I think it's been like eight years now since their one-act shows. And St. Jean's is just such a wonderful um, theater company that just allows actors to experience all different types of theater, whether it be big, like bigger musical productions or one-act productions that are produced and written by the people that are directing them. There's, It's just a very fluid and beautiful experience. So... Yeah, that's a little bit about me. Incredible. Um, I have heard of the St. Jean's players, and I have a friend who was in a show, I think, this past fall. Um, so I know they are a very well-respected, well-known um, community theater group, group in New York, and there's a lot of history, and it's been around for a long time. So Sharon, can you tell us a little bit about how everything got started with the St. Jean's? Yeah. Well, I've been with the St. Jean's Players now for um, more than 37 years. So, yeah, I was young. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, as I like to tell some of the people in our shows, I've been with this group since before you were born. Uh, and even, even I have not been there from the beginning. So the show, uh, the group really started in the 1970s. So it's almost 50 years. Unfortunately, none of the people that were around then are here to tell us all the backstory. So we've lost a little bit of the history, but 
from what I understand, the, the group started at St. Jean Baptiste Church, which is where we're performing right now. And uh, that's at 76 and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan. And then bounced around to different places, including uh, the Einhorn Auditorium and Lenox Hill Hospital, and they were the Einhorn players, and then they were in a bunch of different places. They were the new IMARD players in some other room. I don't know exactly where. By the time I joined the group in 1986, we had been several years in residence at Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church, and we were the MAP players, MAP, and we were there pretty consistently until 1991 when we went to St. Jean's, and that's when we named ourselves the St. Jean Players, and we had a great tenure there until uh, but the pandemic, and then we lost access to the high school auditorium in which we had been performing and rehearsing all those years, so we were in a great position where we rehearsed every night in the theater in which we were going to be performing, which is such a rarity in New York to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, it was a high school auditorium, so it wasn't perfect, but what was really nice about it is you came in, the, the, the auditorium was right there. It sort of simulated a theater, not like a lot of these places we've looked at theaters where you go in, you take the elevator up to the fifth floor and there's your theater. So it's a little different feel, you know? And so we, uh, we really miss having that place available not to mention about the fact that it's just a lot more expensive now for us to do theater because we have to rent rehearsal space and we have to rent a theater. So luckily uh, for this show, we are in the theater at St. James, which is not the high school auditorium. It's actually a professional theater that has been carved out of the space below the church. And so we're lucky enough to be performing there. Marjorie said it's a beautiful theater and it is. Uh, so we're really happy to be in there. It's so popular. We don't get in there for every show. We haven't been there actually since 2022. So we're always checking in. Hey, you got a space for us? So we'll be there for two weekends. And the, you know, the group has always been composed of people that just love to do theater. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not a group that you are not equity approved. Nobody gets paid. We all do it just because we love it. And because it's New York, we get our share of people that have come to New York to try to be professionals. And while they're waiting to be professionals, they discover us, they come work with us. Some of them stick around in New York and join our board and become long-term members. And some of them eventually realize that they're not gonna make it in New York and they go back to where they came from. So uh, we have a real mix of people of you know different ages and, uh, but what, everybody has in common is they just, they love to make theater, whether it's on stage or off stage, directing, costuming, uh, doing other things. And so we just, we have fun is what we do. Um, Marjorie was saying it's a big cast of 15. The biggest cast I've been in with St. Jean's was when we did the Music Man, which Lucy was in as well. We had a cast of 50 which was oh insane. It was absolutely insane. That When I told the customer we had cast 50 people, I thought she was going to faint. Uh, and <laughs> since then, when I direct, I try to limit my cast size to 32. I direct musicals. So, you need, you know, you need an ensemble and all. But, you know, 32 people is still a lot of people, but it's not so much that, you know, somebody's going to die trying to clog them all. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, 15 to me sounds like a small cast, but... <laughs> <laughs> it all depends on your perspective. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that's just um, very inspiring what you just said about the rich history of the St. Jean's players. And it just shows that um, your group has really like stood the test of time. Um, yeah. It's true, you know, I mean, I'm a producer too, and productions are not cheap and, you know, and there's a lot of black box theater out there. So um, congratulations on being on, in such a beautiful theater as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's wonderful. So now I really want to talk about the show that you're working on right now. Um, the Laramie Project. So you, Eugene, if you can please tell us about it for our viewers that may not know the history and how this, um, sadly is based on a very tragic event that happened a long time ago. If you could just please just walk us through the whole background of this um, very touching uh, production, please. Sure, well, actually I'm gonna turn this part over to Lucy 
because uh, I'm going to focus more on the directing part, and uh, Lucy's uh, will be our historian for this okay. particular. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, and I'm I've put out a, a an order to stop any fire engines and other sirens to pass by while I'm speaking. So fingers <laughs> crossed. No, it's all right. Anyway, as you mentioned, Julia, this is based on a tragic true event, the Laramie Project. Um, Matthew Shepard um, was a young 21-year-old man, native Wyoming, Wyomingan, is that the word? Um, and he was a college student at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. And in early October of 1998, he was... Um, beaten, tied to a fence in the middle of nowhere out in, on the prairie and left to die by two people he met in a local bar. Um, he languished for 18 hours before he was found by a local teenager. And he subsequently died a few days later of his injuries. And the people who brutalized him were people from the town who he met at a bar who ostensibly offered to drive him home um, from the bar, but instead they attacked him. They beat him, they robbed him, they accused him of coming on to them sexually. Matthew was gay, um, that didn't happen. And to make a long story short, after his death, what ordinarily probably would have been just a small local story it became this big, huge news story. Um, Stations around the United States and around the world were reporting on it. And Matthew Shepard's parents, Judy and Dennis Shepard, were kind of, it was surreal. They were unprepared to deal for the, with the kind of attention that the death of their son um, created. It, you know, it was, the, it was the death of the son and then it became this phenomenon. And to cut to the chase, ultimately, what they did was they formed a foundation called the Matthew Shepard Foundation. And the original intent was um, for parents of gay teenagers and gay children to have resources and a place where they can learn to deal with their children who, you know, to cope with mm -hmm. children who are uncomfortable coming out to their parents and to be better parents to gay children. Um, that's what it started out as, but now um, the foundation has, also morphed into, or they helped enable pioneering hate hate crime legislation in the United le, legislation in the United States. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and in nineteen no two thousand nine, I guess that was under the Obama administration, mm -hmm. um, because of the work by the Matthew Shepard Foundation and others, including um, the family of I think it was James Byrd Jr. in. Texas, who was a black man who also in 1998 was was killed by two white men. You may have remembered the story. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I believe the two families got together with the help of the foundation to push for hate crime legislation, legis wow. legislation, which is now in place. Wow, that's great. That's really, yeah. Um, I just can't believe something like this, you know, took place. Um, it's it's really horrific, and I, I you know, commend you all for bringing this project to the St. James Players because, of course, we want to be in a world where there are no hate crimes, you know, and there's no violence and things like that. But sadly, um, it's still out there, and I think it's important to do these kind of productions um, to. Uh, bring awareness to people and really just, you know, remind us like, hey, we still need to work on this. So thank you for giving us that history um, about the Laramie Project. Um, Gus, do you have any questions or anything? Uh, I, I was just curious, um, you, you mentioned the foundation, but has the show itself been sanctioned by uh, Matthew's family or anything like that? Or I'm, I'm sure they support it, right? Well, as you probably know, we had to get the rights for the play, but that's right, right. supported uh -huh. through the foundation. But the foundation does provide resources to productions, um, to companies that um, right. will, that put on productions. And they will produce it. Uh, they don't necessarily produce it, but they will uh, provide factual information. They are, I believe, sending us some um, 
ephemera that we can use in the lobby of um, letters that were sent at the time to the family, copies of letters that we could put as part of our lobby display. I believe they are um, instrumental in getting members of, um, I don't know about from the Tectonic Theater Company, which is the company in New York which first produced this, um, but they arrange for talkbacks sometimes with members of the Shepherd family and other people involved in the case um, as well. So that's how they support productions if, if you choose to ask for it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, and now, you know, this, this is my, my, uh, my nerd actor questions to Eugene. How, how do you juggle the, the rehearsals and all the, you know, do, do you, do you break it down in, you know, scenes with the same people and then you just do that scene or, uh, I, I mean, eventually you're going to have to have a run through but how, how's that how's working uh, okay um yeah i'd be happy to jump into that well it's um it, it's a combination we pretty we do it during the week we'll do it sort of chronologically so every night we do a different act so we're dealing with well just let me take it back a little and say these are 15 actors who are playing about 70 roles right in the original production it was only eight actors uh, playing about 10 roles each. Now I have skimmed off and made, created 15 roles out of the eight, uh, 15 mm -hmm. acting. And uh, so they're each playing about five or six people. Uh, so during the week, we do one act at a time. People are playing multiple parts. And then on Saturday afternoons at my apartment, so we don't have to pay for rehearsal space, I work individually with actors on their roles. So like if you have five different parts you're playing, will do your five different parts just the within the part. time that I have set aside for you. So it's a combination of both. But what's really important in this play is the the, the combination, it's the ensemble of everybody moving. And uh, I can talk about that in a little while if you'd like, but because that was more than my <laughs> yeah. biggest challenge. Yeah, I've, I've always like, you know, especially with a, with a huge cast like that, uh, I, I'm not much of a musical actor, but I've done some musicals and it's it's just like hurting cats not you know <laughs> so uh it, it I, I I love to hear about that that the the technical part of uh, the rehearsals uh and it's smart yes rehearse in your apartment you know <laughs> um so Eugene um so I do know yeah it's a big cast so what happens in the play is that this theater group goes out there to um to Laramie and they interview the people, like the witnesses is, and then is that, it's like the testimony of what happened, right? That's what happens in this play. Can you take us through the synopsis sure. and just like your rehearsal process? And um, just sure. to give you one last thing, just what do you hope the audience will just take away from uh, this production? Okay, I got a lot to talk about. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, glad. Um, and that's fine. The um. Uh, what was your first question about the, uh, the, the synopsis, synopsis and mm -hmm. structure of the play? So actually the Tectonic Theater Company run by Moises Kaufman um, mm -hmm. went to Laramie and interviewed much, much more than they ever expected to. The, he says in the play that we've made, I think, six trips over the course of two years. Um, so it got to be much bigger than they expected. It was not only the witnesses, it was uh, residents of the town, it was the police, it was anyone that had anything to do with it, and even people who didn't, because you get a lot of opinions. What makes this play fascinating is it runs the gamut of opinions. You think everyone's going to be horrified and shocked by the event, and most mm -hmm. people are, but it's surprising when you hear some people say, oh, I think he deserved it. He was, he was a real bar fly, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's shocking stuff, and that's all in the play. Um, so they interviewed the gamut. Um, and uh, the way it's constructed is they just, you know, they are the company and they they play all the roles of the people they're interviewing. And my hat's off to the cast because they're all creating various characters. You know, all they wow. have is a hat to differentiate them one person from another, but an accent or a way of talking or whatever, we're working on it together and they're developing some great characterizations. So, so they're- Wow, terrific. it sounds very diverse. Um, so, yeah. Um, so how long have you been rehearsing for? Has it been like months? <laughs> like what has no, been? No, 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 no. We, we, <laughs> we just, we're about to go into our fifth week, uh, five out of seven. So we're a little more than halfway there. 
Um, in a way, I don't count tech week because that has its own problems. So it's really six weeks um, and we've done four. Um, and oh. uh, if I can, I'll just tell you a little bit about the rehearsal process. Yes. Because for me, for me, it was like nothing else I've ever done. Um, I'm used to working on plays that have dialogue and, and some action. And, uh, and this play has very little of either. It's predominantly monologues. Uh, that's mm. not to say it's not dramatic, because some of these monologues will tear your heart out. But there's not a lot of movement going on. Um, mm -hmm. And so it became my task, I guess, before the show even started rehearsing, to try to figure out a way to bring some movement into the show. So uh, for better or worse, and my cast is probably hating me for this, <laughs> we've got 15 actors using 15 chairs, moving them around throughout the course of the night to create mini scenes. Oh, that's okay? so interesting. So if, you, if you have somebody from the Tectonic Company interviewing two residents, you've got three chairs sitting there, and then they will get up and those chairs will be rearranged to create another little uh, group. So uh, we've been working a lot on the blocking of this show. <laughs> That is very uh, clever because I can totally like uh, visualize that. Sorry, Gus, go ahead. No, no, I said that 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 sounds uh, great, and they probably do hate you for it. But it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna be a great show. Uh, yeah, I and, think and, so. Uh, because... Yeah, I, I mean, as always, I was I go ahead, go ahead. No, I'm just gonna say quite honestly, I I I don't like to look at other productions when I direct. But I did go on YouTube and look at the beginning mm. of some other productions. And I saw things that I wasn't crazy about. There were some sometimes where they have all the actors sitting on stage the whole time. And I just thought, well, that's a big snooze. Um, <laughs> you know, and then they get up and they say their speech and they sit down again. I wanted more movement. And I think we've worked hard to get a lot of movement into the show to make it more interesting than it already is. That's excellent. I mean, and I and I like to, you know, ask these technical questions because I'm a, a lot of actors watch this, you know, and they're they're interested. It's not just about going to see a show, but you know, if you're interested in the behind the scenes type of thing, uh, it is is always really cool to to hear uh the, the way directors work and the way actors work and the way they are, are like arrive to their characters and and and, and things like that. And it's and it's really interesting, you know. I I knew this was not uh um the the actual story like you know the story like they did the movie of the week of what happened but as seen through the eyes of the town and that is actually e even more uh interesting to to see people like, like you said you know some folks are like uh not as compassionate some people everybody has their own their own take which kind of opens a, a a different dimension uh than just well, Matthew's story and the people who did this to him. So I, I, it, it should be really, really. I mean, it is. But I would love to. I'd love to to go see it and 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 check it out and see see how it it unfolds. Yeah, I think the audience will feel like so many emotions. You know, I mean, just you know, just us talking about it. It's like, oh my god, I feel sad. And you know, if you hear someone who would dare say like. I'm glad that happened or something, I would feel so angry. So I think it's going to be like, a, you know, the audience is really going to feel many things on many levels. And I think Eugene, you're um, directing of making the monologues be like mini scenes in a way and moving the chairs. Like I said, it is adding like some more layers, some more depth, like a, a more dimension to this uh, really tragic and unforgettable story. So when the audience comes and see this, and I'm sure we're gonna be crying, but what what do you think, like, what do you want them to take away from this playing? Okay, well, I'll, I'll be brief because we ha I haven't let other people talk yet, but there are, <laughs> there are two major takeaways. I've been thinking about this. Um, one is, um, and you kind of got into this before, the fact that um, this event happened 23 years ago, the play was uh, 25 years ago, the play was 23 years ago, but I want people to realize, unfortunately, it's not just a history lesson. This is still going on today. Hate crimes are still going on. As a matter of fact, statistics tell us that they are on the rise over the last few years. So um, they should realize that this is still an ongoing problem. Legislation still has to work, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, the political side, the social side. So that's one thing I want them to realize. And the other more personal thing that I'd like them to think about is um, that uh, 
homophobia and prejudice and hate are not just um, manifested in a, a major hateful crime like this, they come out in small ways as well. And you see that throughout the play. Uh, there's a wonderful little speech that the Catholic priest gives to his interviewers um, where he says, he says something like, you know, every time you are called a faggot or a dyke, the seeds of violence are being instilled um, because um, that is violence in its own way. I mean, it may not be killing somebody, but you're doing harm. You're doing terrible harm. And I want the audience to realize, just be kind to your fellow man. Be, be tolerant. I mean, it's a very simplistic way of saying it, but um, a little a little damage can be very damaging. Yeah, um, just on that note, and then I'll, I'll, I would love to hear from the cast. But yeah, on that note, you know, I do agree with that. That's like a seed, like you planted, you know, you spread it to one person, then that person spreads it to someone, then it grows and then it becomes, you know, like 2024, the world we live in today, sadly. Um, and I really would like to hear about the actors, our Marjorie Cohn and Scott Watson Morones, about your roles. And please tell us about your characters. What do you love about them? What are some things that you found challenging? Um, and Marjorie, can we please start with you? Well, um... I think the most poignant um, piece that I have, and it's it's a very short piece, it's um, the grandmother of one of the accused is um, talking to the shepherds and also to the judge, pleading for uh, two, I always get this wrong, two concurrent life sentences rather than consecutive. I guess if it's concurrent, there's a chance for parole. If it's consecutive, mm -hmm. then there's no chance for parole. So she's there pleading for the judge to have mercy. And it's just heartbreaking to me to be playing a real person, first of all. And that's, I, I've i done some research on the characters because they're, they're not characters, they're people. <laughs> People, mm -hmm. you know, been alive and and uh, so I find that um, not challenging, but I feel humbled by it. And so that's one of my more difficult monologues. It makes me <laughs> want to cry every time. I don't even have to memorize that one. I can read it, but uh -huh. I'm reading a statement to the judge and and to this uh, something that she and her family have prepared and it's very sad but wow. then i the other role i really like i play marge huh. what do you know oh wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I, that um she's just a great character and i've done some research on her she was married three times she had affairs and oh she's just i don't know Fun. she was bartender and uh i just she, she's a a wonderful person. I just, I just love her. So that's a oh, wow. privilege to be creating this person. Yes. I'm just seeing you the way that you talk about those two characters. I can already see the performance, how they're going to be two totally um, different roles. Um, guys, did you want to say something? No, I mean, it, it, and I think it's interesting. Um, sometimes playing characters that uh, uh, does either one of you play a character that you maybe you don't identify with or you like disagree with this character 100 yeah yeah <laughs> okay yeah definitely. tell us uh -huh. well i mean i think before i go into that i think i don't know if marjorie you're done but i think that one of the things that's a challenge for all of us as actors in this type of show not necessarily the um, dialect of the show or the meaning of the show is that it's a show where I had a great acting teacher that told me um, that sometimes, you know, you'll be in shows that are called Our Town shows. So, you know, the famous play Our Town, which is a mm -hmm. famous play where there's no scene, there's no set. So with an Our Town show, you as the actor doesn't necessarily um, have to just be your character, getting your lines out, being this character. You as the character have to be able to identify the 
location you're in, the time you're in, the movement you're in, the weather you're in. So it's so much, um, it's so much more as a challenge, I think, out of, uh, for all of us actors, because we are doing a play with such minimal right. set and costume. And um, I guess, as Eugene even said before, as much like traditional, you know, play flow where there's a scene ends and there's a new backdrop right. and there's a new, you know, a, a new chair comes in and there's a new fancy costume and a new actor enters. It's it's one of those challenges that um, very few shows get to do and get to give to actors to do in such a beautiful way. So it's such a blessing for us to do this show because, um, I mean, so far in the rehearsal process, it's been fabulous to really just work with a bunch of actors that can give it that our town type of, of, of a play where we're kind of breathing the the set we're in, the time we're in, the the um, the kind of feel and nature that is this show I think um you know also on top of you know having to being like being able to let the audience know what time period we're in with everything with a very minimal set and um and kind of flow of of, of the show uh, we're also challenged as actors to play multiple role roles um and Myself, I mean, I go from playing uh, a Baptist minister who, you know, has a line in the show where he's talking to actually uh, one of the characters that Marjorie plays and uh, mm -hmm. and says, you know, I hope that Matthew Shepard had time to reflect on his lifestyle, meaning that I hope that Matthew Shepard, as he was in a coma, as he was about to go into a coma, had time to reflect on his lifestyle. And me as a gay man, I married my husband last year. You know, it's a lot for me. It's 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 definitely a challenging role to play. Yeah. But yeah. um, but it is real. And um, there's also another character I play where he's a detective of the town that from working on this case, he was able to understand other people's views and understand the homosexual community and to not and the LGBT community as a whole and understand them as 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 him and not judge them on on who they love and and understanding them as just normal people. Um, and he makes this point where where he says that there are always going to be people, people that hold on to their old ideals. And mm -hmm. listen, we're we're in America and we're yeah. although we, we would like to say that we're, you know, a country where, you know, we all always listen to each other's opinions and views. There are people that won't, um, as we see, right. especially during this this time right now where we're going into a presidential election. But, right. um, <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, it, it does re require, like it kind of forces you to, to bring an honesty when you play someone who you would like totally despise as a human being, right? But oh, you yeah. have to remember they're a human being. And w when you portray them, right? Yeah, you have to you have to give them their humanity, no matter how much you think they uh, they're like the worst person in the world, or or their their ideas are like abhorrent to you, you know. And but then you you have to put put that aside to play them with honesty, and it, that I, I that is a, that is a, a, a awesome challenge for like any actor. So um, yes. so on that. A point that Gus just raised. So, how do you do that as actors when you're getting into these characters? I know Marjorie mentioned earlier that you know she does some research. That is part of her process. So, I'm just wondering, um, for Marjorie and, and Scott, for your process, especially when, like Gus said, you're playing these characters that completely different from you, not your ideals. Like, how do you start getting into the mind, body, heart, and soul of that person? I just go with instinct. <laughs> Having never taken an acting class, I don't know what the oh, teacher wow. is. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, right. Scott, well, how do you like start your process of getting into that kind of character? This is crazy, and you're gonna think I'm crazy from saying this, but I always try to enact every single character doing something that I've done in the past couple of months, right? So like, how would this character go to a deli and order cold cuts? How would they sound? 
how would they act? How would they stand? Would they be abrasive? Mm -hmm. What would they be wearing? How would they uh, walk into the room? Would they demand it? Would they be very quiet? Would they be scared to order something? Would they, you know, if the if the person who cut the ham too thin, would they say something or would they make a scene? I always try to think of a character in a similar situation that I was recently in or like something that I've done on a daily, right? How would they react? And then taking that, you know, kind of, meshing combination of of me who's giving this character the breath who's giving the character this body that's giving the character this voice you know I have to kind of first find how it how I can make that character relate to something that I do every day and then from there it will kind of come out and that's I guess how I look at every type of character and how I can always give a character some sort of aspect of naturalism right you never, I, maybe Eugene loves to compliment me on this, but it's something that I've always been very kind of proud of myself for doing is always trying to find some naturalism in the character, right? I never want to sound like I'm reading the lines as I'm performing a character, right? Mm -hmm. I try to find some sort of a natural flow to a character, which could be harder than actually understanding the, or th than actually reading and memorizing the lines. It's, it's a whole other process, but yeah. that's always what I like to do first is try to imagine that character doing something that's similar in your life since you're the blood and the body and the and the bones of, of this character. Um, you know, how would it actually reflect to you before you give them life? Wow, so interesting. Um, and also, you know, I think Marjorie and Scott, I, I commend you guys and the whole cast um on a couple of things that you touched on is really about using your imagination you know as artists we we do that a lot and um also like the details um Scott of what you're mentioning and uh what you mentioned about making this person real human um so I I commend you you both and the whole cast because I'm sure the other cast members also have creative ways of getting into these characters um and also it's very interesting that there is no set. So you really, so the actor really has to, you just have to kind of transport yourself, you know, at that time, location. Um, so I think that just, you know, it's, it's really wonderful. And I, I do think I'll be able to come and see to come see the show. So I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, Gus, what are your thoughts on this? Hearing the well, which brings process. us to performance times and locations and stuff. Uh, Tell us. Well, I'm going to get into that out in a, oh, okay. a little bit later. Yeah, I have all the information right here. Um, but yeah, it's I think especially for um, our viewers who may not be, you know, in the arts, who may not be actors, I think it's very fascinating to hear the actor's process. So thank you for letting us in on that, because I know that can be very, you know, like personal and intimate. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. So someone that we haven't heard from in a little while, I would love to talk to the assistant director, Lucy Apicello. Just tell us about this journey and this production and being the assistant director. How has it been good for you? <laughs> it's, I, I've been acting and involved in theater for a really long time and I love directing. And in many ways, I kind of love it more than acting because you were, it's your, it's your rodeo, you, you know, you're God. Um, but to this show in particular, I had just finished stage managing the last show St. Jean's did, which was working the musical. And that might've been the show that your friend was in. I don't know. And yes, Lori Salmon. Oh, Lori, Lori yes, of course. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and I worked with Eugene for the first time last year when he directed Six Degrees of Separation, um, which is a play I loved. Um, so I think we connected there because I think we have similar tastes in theater and I was working was a very difficult show to work on. There were a lot of moving parts. There was a big cast. Um, it was a success, but as stage manager, that's a whole other animal. And I had barely, um, caught my breath on that. And I'd gotten an email from Eugene asking me if I would be interested in being the assistant director. And it was funny because I was thinking, I definitely want to get on stage, but I don't know if there's a role for me in this show. Then when, and, 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 but the minute I saw it was Eugene asking, I said, yeah, I'm in. 
So that's how I got involved. But what do I do? Um, I'm a sounding board for Eugene um, <laughs> in a lot of things. Um, and I help right now, the last couple of weeks, what I've been doing is I'm on book a lot for the actors, but it's not just, oh, Scott, you said this instead of those, or you said market instead of store. It's pointing out things in the script, nuances and things like that, that sometimes actors don't see or miss, or because you're just trying to remember your lines or working mm -hmm. on your characterization. And I really like getting through to the nitty gritty of a script and you know pointing things out like that. Um, and other things I'm helping with are, you know, the blocking, the musical chairs, as we've been, <laughs> as we've been doing. I love that. Love the that. musical chairs, um, and pretty much, um, I've got my little finger in a bunch of different little pots, and I love it. It's very rewarding, and then to work with such a great cast hmm. is the cherry on the on the cake. Yeah, awesome. it sounds like you're really enjoying the whole um, the whole production, <laughs> and you're you're doing a lot of important things in it. Um, Gus, do you have any questions for Lucy? No, I, I think I think we we covered on, and, I, and I I do agree. Sometimes you know you, you have to uh, the the little nuances sometimes go uh you know uh, you gloss over them because you're so focused on trying to put the show together, you know, and and then you're like, well, this line doesn't you know this line could mean a bunch of things, and then you know you you get into the start studying these these little things that um create levels so so that that's a that's a really that's a really cool thing um you know for you know I, I, I an asset for a director to have you know to to be to, to have someone to bounce ideas from and be like hey by the way this line doesn't mean this it, it could mean that or uh, uh you know things like that um i mean julie and i do it uh she she I do it a little less because it takes me like a year to write a 10 minute play. Uh, so I, <laughs> by, by the time, you know, uh, I, 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 you know, by the time I have something to, to bounce off, it's like something uh, minimal, but sometimes I, you know, it, it, it's interesting, you know, it's necessary to have somebody else's perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think what I'm getting is that you and Eugene are a great team and work really well together. So um, that can, I can already see that it's enhancing the production. Um, I'm going to announce, you know, the show dates and times and all the information. But before I do that, I just want to ask each person, what is one word, if you can sum it up in one word, um, used to describe the uh, Lyra Me project? And Sharon, you can start us off on that. Just one word to summarize this incredible uh story and message and production the word i would pick is challenging challenging for the actors for the director but also it's a challenge to the audience eugene i'm trying to come up with one i know devastating is not really the right word but it's <laughs> it's emotionally a powerhouse i would say um lucy what do you think this is going to sound weird but um, one of the characters at the end of one scene says, what we have is H-O-P-E, hope. And I f I, I'm finding that with this story, maybe it will instill hope or teach people that there is still hope that things can change. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, that's a wonderful message. Uh, Marjorie and Scott, what are your thoughts of one word? <laughs> well, how about to abolish hate? <laughs> Yes. And I got two, the, two really good I, ones. I got uh, these buttons and um, the money that I paid for them, part of the proceeds went to the Matthew Shepard Foundation. So now I'm a member of the Matthew Shepard Foundation. Oh, amazing. That's amazing. Uh, yep. Abolish hate. She has it up there. <laughs> so mm -hmm. the, I'm going to say two words. Abolish hate. Wonderful. Uh, Scott, one word. <laughs> no, you know what? I'm, so, I so was the say, button again. Yeah, sure. I'm gonna show you, <laughs> you this go. button. Yeah, yeah. That's the right hate button. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm like you know. I always say, I think overall, just this whole process, what it's, I think, allowed us to do with each other as actors and directors and behind the scenes. It's allowed us to trust, trust each other. Um, as Sharon mentioned before, you know, we we were so used to because I've been working with St. Jean's for a, you know at least eight years. I think I was so used to 
always going to the space that I was going to be performing in. And now we have a challenge where, you know, we have to be in all different types of spaces and and different rehearsal spaces. So I think it's it's a whole different um, aspect of how you deal with your actors and your directors. It's a whole trust aspect. And I think that also falls into the message of the show is trusting each other and loving each other and caring. So for some reason, trust is is the, trust. Is the word that comes to mind. And I'd like to show this. This is a picture of Matthew Shepard. It's Matthew, oh, wow. right. They sent that to me when I bought yeah. the button. Oh my God, that's a beautiful picture. Beautiful and picture. I, I, I think that, you know, the thing to remember, you know, and I know it sounds cheesy and like a cliche, but like these uh, horrible things that happen in tragedies, you know, they they can produce something good like this show, you know, something, one little good thing can come out of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's slow. Is is a slow road, but but uh, if if you you can get one positive thing to come out of like something like this, is worth it. it. I mean, it's not worth the tragedy, but but it's worth the effort to pursue it. Wonderful. I just I love what everyone said. So heartfelt, so touching, so authentic. Um. So on that note, I have to tell our viewers run don't just walk to buy <laughs> tickets for this amazing production tickets are on sale now i'm going to give you all the information i'm also going to put it in the description of this video so tickets are now on sale so please get your tickets so the performance is march 15th through the 17th and march 22nd through the 24th fridays and saturdays at 7 30 and sundays at 2 p.m. So you have to go to this beautiful theater that we're all raving about, <laughs> the theater at St. Jean's, 150 East, 76th Street, between Lexington and 3rd Avenues. You, If you're in Manhattan, you just take the 6th train, you go to 77th Street or the Q train to 72nd Street. So it's a very, very easy commute. On that note, um, this space is wheelchair and walker access. So if you're in need of that, then the accessible entrance is on Lexington Avenue between 75th and 76th Street, just south of the church entrance. So it's super accessible, very convenient commute. Please go and check out the Laramie Project. Um, I think it's a powerful story and I think it's it will cost us, no matter what side you're on, you know, I mean, I think it, it's a good way to reflect on where we have been, who we are now, and where we are going um, to really just look at ourselves and ask, you know, those tough questions. I think, hey, it's 2024, it's time. <laughs> um, on that note, I wanna thank everyone so much. Sharon Lowe, Eugene uh, Lefkowitz, the director for being with us, assistant director, Lucy Apicello, the two actors that were able to join us today. My dear friend and talented actress and playwright that Gus and I have known for years, Marjorie Cohn. <laughs> um, thank you for connecting us uh, to have this beautiful conversation and Scott Watson Morones. I can't wait to see the show. I think Gus and I can definitely make one of the dates. I really appreciate you taking the time for this um, very heartfelt, thought provoking, inspirational conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. So it was our on, that pleasure. Note, <laughs> on that note, this has been a wonderful evening. I don't want to sign off, but we are. Um, please subscribe to our channel. This is all about shining a spotlight on you, artists. Uh, you're off off Broadway theater productions. It doesn't necessarily have to be in New York, even though we're New York based. It could be outside of New York. We want to talk about what you're doing, and if you want to subscribe to our channel, just hit the subscribe button just to get notifications of uh, upcoming episodes. And we can have these er enriching, powerful, inspiring conversations. Um, Gus, any last words before we sign off? Yes, thank you to uh, our, our, uh, our theater company that, that joined us today and see you next time. See you next time, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys.